Just how we do it on the avenue. All right, all right. We are back for another episode of Suniva Lifestyles presents What's Happening Podcast. I'm Tim, one of the co-hosts. We got Primo Michael. What's up, what's up? Sitting in for uh, Jeffro, we got Chris. Filling in the shoes. What up, brother? Substitute teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and we got Metal Metal Chris. I mean, uh, uh, George. My bad, my bad. Whoa, my bad. Whoa, whoa, right off the bat. <laughs> we got George. Cut. <laughs> the shot. Part of the shot. Right on. And we got uh, our paid intern, right? Chico. <laughs> 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 ah, look, you already know, first time he got yeah, paid, dude, nigga, yeah, yeah, he's already uh, slacking. Yeah, you're, you, dude, you're on ninety day probation. Don't forget, it still, <laughs> right? Right. That's, that's, <laughs> the, that's, that's the money. That's the money horn at uh, at Pantera's. That, like, yeah, that, on, the, use that, on know. the main stage. <laughs> Where's little Hayes at? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, today we got a special guest, right? Right. And uh, we've got special introduction music to get him uh, introduced. Go for it. And the man in charge at the sound of the bell, Mr. Wes Melton. Hey, right on, there you right go. Big honor. Thanks for coming through. Thanks for coming through. Thanks for coming through. We got professional boxing referee, Mr. Wesley Melton, here as a guest. Welcome. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you threw Tim for laughing. I thought you were going to tell me laughing. Yeah. <laughs> I thought you were going to uh, give me the rules and shit. <laughs> okay, no, keep them up, man. Yeah, keep them up. Keep Timmy, them up. Timmy. No head butting below the belt. <laughs> <laughs> <This episode. Yeah. laughs> See, that's how it's, it's, it's going to go. Right? But uh, welcome. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you. Welcome and so uh, we have a couple of folks in the audience here. They might chime in. They're not on camera, but uh, they may chime in here once in a while. Right? Right? We have a live studio audience. We have audience. a live studio audience. It's like the price is right. We got a live studio audience <laughs> in this on one. Down. All right. So, Wesley, um, we talked a little bit. We had, uh, Actually, we had a good... Uh, Good conversation here in the last half hour or so. You're from around here, right? Grew up right here in the hood, right down the street. Right on. So why don't you walk us through, you know, where you're from and, and you know, your, where you went to uh, high school, what you did, you know, just kind of walk us through it. And then we'll get to, to you know, how you became a referee and, and some of the fights you did and give us some background and stuff that um, the average fan doesn't know, you know, goes on behind the scenes in terms of, uh, you know, the fight world. Cool. All right. Yeah, well, uh, right down the street, 38th Avenue in McDowell, which is one block north. Right. You guys here on 39th and Roosevelt. Right. And uh, we moved over there, and I was like uh, one year old, 1955. Uh, wow. We had a house there, and I started going to uh, Butler School when I was okay. six years old. Actually, I started, I went to, uh, my, my parents put me into um, uh, <clears throat> preschool. Like oh. at Capitol School over on on on, on uh, Van Buren and about Fifteenth uh, Avenue. It's called Capitol School, right by the Capitol. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. It was Still kindergarten there. school. Okay, but I only lasted a couple weeks over there. <laughs> 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 but, Somebody tried to take my wagon and it didn't work out too well. <laughs> oh, so you're boxing back then. Yeah, huh? I was trying, brother. You know, I wasn't doing much, but uh, so. But I started uh, grade school at uh, at Butler School and and. Uh, and that's where I got to know the Heisers. All and right. My buddy yeah. said next to me, Jack Heiser. Right and on. We've been friends uh, ever since then. So went to uh, Butler first through sixth. Right. So you could have met any other people, but you got met these guys. <laughs> well, you know, we, we're, we're, we're both little skinny guys. But yeah. for some reason, he called me Wilo. I didn't have a name for him. <laughs> you just called him Skinny. No, Wilito. He used to call me Wilito. Yeah. So uh, we hung out together because we were about the same size. We were little skinny dudes. Right on. You know? And... Uh, it was funny because we we uh, had a great relationship from that all the way up to uh, junior high, high school. Uh, we went to college together. Jack My. was a kicker. I was a linebacker. I didn't last very long. Jack did. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Jack was one of the the best uh, field goal kick kickers in the nation. But uh, so that's, you know, that's where's my education part of it, uh, you know, but uh, my mother, we just sold her house only a few years ago. Really? Uh, wow. she, yeah, we always said because she would rent it out and uh, people, you know, they wouldn't take care of it. Sure. Cause it was, so we, me and my brother was always having to fix it up. And we go, Mom, you got to get rid of this house. It's a pain in the butt. Right. She goes, no, nope, that's where all your boys were born. You go, I'm yeah. not going to get rid of it because uh -huh. I have three brothers. And so... She wouldn't get rid of it because really? that's where her 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 kids were born, and so we, you know, respected her, you know, honored her wishes, and yeah. we just finally sold it because it was just too much, and she finally agreed. So, 
you know, I'm a big part of the hood, and what an honor right. to be able to come down here. All these guys here, uh, most of the, uh, all the hyzers, the yeah. boys, I didn't know the girls too much. They wouldn't let me talk to them. <laughs> <laughs> good big brothers, good big brothers. <laughs> Get your wheelo hands off of yeah, <laughs> wheelo, you don't. We don't go like that. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, and it's funny because one of the, the things that stood out for me when I first met Jack uh, you know, we went through first grade. So about in the third grade, we all hang out together. And uh, he's one day he says, hey, man, why don't you come over to my house? He goes, well, my brother's a boxer. And I go, wow, man, no kidding. Yeah. And he goes, yeah, man. I go, okay. So we came over here. And we were like in the third grade. I remember we were like nine <laughs> years old, bro. <laughs> we weighed about 50 pounds. No, yeah. maybe 40. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're about that big. So he goes, uh, so uh, it was Joe Heiser. Yeah. Yeah, that's, Joe Heiser. That's my dad. Uh, yep. The, old, the oldest mm -hmm. uh, of the Heisers. Like, I don't know if you guys, is, does he have sisters that are older than, than Joe? No, he, he was the Joe, oldest. He's the oldest. He's okay. the oldest. Yeah, so was Joe was cool, man, because he uh, he got us in there and he put gloves on us, man, and uh, and we would start to spar and all that, you yeah. know. And it's funny because over the years, you know, I'd always bring it up that me and Jack used to, you know, spar. Right, and right. And then uh, as one day, he goes, he goes, Willow, he goes, you remember what happened when you sparred, right? And I go, no, what happened, bro? He goes, you know, I knocked you out. <laughs> 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 and I go, Jack, I don't remember that. He yeah. goes, well, you probably didn't because I knocked you out. <laughs> That's awesome. So I said, no, why do you have to put it like that, Jack? <laughs> I have some great stories about Jack, man. I could go back and back. One of the one of the greatest guys I've ever met in my life, like a brother. Oh, man, you're making him blush over well, there. He, he, he already knows it, <laughs> That's man. cool, man. I mean, right we're, anything he would ask me, I would do. And all of them, Rudy, I've known all those guys all my life. Nice. I grew up in this area, so it's hometown to me, brother. Yeah, you know, yeah. we were talking earlier about, you know, kids these days. It wasn't like back then where you grow up with people, right? You grow up with people in the same neighborhood. You go through, through kindergarten, grade school, high school, right? You just kind of, you know, uh, stay in touch with everybody, man. And so that's something that doesn't really happen anymore these days, quite honestly. So that, that that's way cool. That's way cool. Yeah. And then, so you guys went from Butler, and then you guys went to Carl Hayden? Uh, no, we went to Isaac. Uh, oh, they started okay. at a junior high. Butler originally was from first grade to eighth grade. And then later on, they changed it to sixth, and then they made Isaac School, 35th Avenue in McDowell. Mm -hmm. They made that into junior high, so that's where we went there prior to going to Carl Hayden All right. High School. So then when you guys got to uh, high school, what what uh, what you guys get into there? I mean, Well, you wide. know, yeah, we're, we're athletes. You right. know, we're little guys still. Right, I mean, right. Jack, you know, we we're, we're pretty little skinny dudes and right, stuff, right. and we played... Uh, we played football, freshman football on the, on the little team. They had a they had a pee wee team and a big team. Me and uh -huh. Jack played on the uh, the little team, and then we both wrestled too. Right okay. after that, Jack wrestled, I wrestled, and uh, so we kept this relationship up right. the whole time. And I, what was ironic about Jack finally, uh, you know, later on. He quit wrestling, which was too bad because our, our junior year, we were state champions in right. wrestling. Oh, wow. And the senior years, we, we we had a chance to win it again. And we had this guy named George Jarrell. So we called him Chick, Chicken mm -hmm. Booty. Mm -hmm. yep. We called him Chick yep. for short. And Chick was bad. And I Jack was badass, too. So if we would have had Chick and Jack, we'd have been state champions again, no doubt about it. Nice. Now, I, don't, I don't know what happened to Jack, but I remember Chick's dad made him made him go go to work. Okay. So me and I think it was Dode and a couple guys, another guy, Dodi Garcia, he's mm -hmm. another friend of mine and ours. And uh, we went to go talk to uh, Chick's dad. <laughs> Come let him wrestle. <laughs> he, we need to wrestle, bro. We got a chance to be state champions yeah. again. He goes, hey, hey he's got to work. George got to work. And he looked at us. We go, all right, man. Yeah. All right. Yeah, <laughs> we thanks. don't want to mess with this guy, man. He looks like he just killed somebody. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for hey, stopping George, us. Man, we love you, brother. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you aren't going to be on our team. Yeah. But uh, so we had, we were tight, man. All of us. Good. You know, all, and I have a, a story about uh, Chick because I, I opened up a boxing gym in 1990. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but he came on and helped me train fighters when I first opened up my gym. Yeah, he. he George Jarrell. Yeah, yeah. I think George uh, and and uh, Jack. Uh, your 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 uncle. Yep. Yeah, Jack used to come down there and hang out and, and help us train fighters as well. Yeah, I mean, you know, boxing was it, it's it was big bigger then. Now it's kind of drifting off a little bit, but I think it's coming back. You know what I mean? No doubt about no it. No doubt no, about there, it. There'll always will be. I, I'm just a big. I'm not really an MMA guy, but and I understand it and I get right. it. And, right. But boxing's always been in my blood. Right. So so West, um, uh, just for our out of our uh, audience's info, what year was this at Carl Hayden? Uh, we started in uh, 1969, Carl okay. Hayden. That was our cool. freshman year. Right. We graduated from 72. Okay. 
Okay, and then you guys went to, you, I, I thought we, you said you went we, to PC or No, we, we went to Phoenix, Phoenix College. Uh, we both went on scholarships. Oh, okay. We had three of us from Carl Hayden, actually. It was me, Jack, and this black kid named uh, Rick Mosley, Ricky Mosley. Okay. And uh, naturally, them two guys made the team. And uh, I didn't make the team to start out with, but the coach... Uh, now, Bianco, we're talking football team, Football. Right? This okay, is football, yeah. correct. Well, it was really funny because I went to register and the wrestling coach was there from PC. Mm -hmm. He goes, hey, Melton. He goes, you're going to rep? You're going to wrestle? I go, I don't know, coach. I'm going to play football. And he goes, well, let me get your classes for you. <laughs> <laughs> I go, oh, okay. You're gonna take so he like hooked me up, man, uh, with the best oh, teachers, yeah. the wrestling coach from PC because he thought I was going to wrestle there. Right. And uh, as it turned out, I didn't. <laughs> Hope I don't run into him no yeah. more. But, uh, I remember you. But, uh, yeah. but I used to go in there with him and hang out and practice with him and wrestle with him. And I would have probably did it, but my girlfriend got pregnant. And mm. it just so happens is she went to PC too, and she went to Carl Hayden as well. Okay. Yeah, these guys, even my Norton, Lali Carazosa was their name. Okay. And, and the Rudy Dura and all these guys that... Real pretty Mexican girl, and uh, so we decided to get married, bro. And I was only eighteen years old. So I, said, I love you. Shit, I got. I love you. Well, ain't no right. You got to get a job now. You got to get a job. Forget about the. Forget about that football. You're seeing it away. That ain't making no money. The there. talk wasn't for the dad no more. It was for the wife. He can't. He can't play no more. Yeah. He has to go to work. Yeah. He is yeah. from the hood. Yeah. 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 Jack had to go talk to your wife. Can, yeah. can, 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 can come out with <laughs> Jack would have probably put the shot on her if he went over there. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really awesome. man no so that was that's what happened there and, and you know those guys went on and did really well and and i missed it football was my love it just i wasn't a very big guy and right. they had me playing linebacker bro i was oh. playing linebacker and i only like when i went when i was a freshman i only weighed like 185 pounds and they were, oh. i was playing middle linebacker at junior college he said you know, so only 180 <laughs> <and> a freshman <laughs> yeah. That's well, and, and hey man back the then 90, they run them the student body sweep where the guards came out and your job was to knock down the interference and all those linemen are like you know almost 300 pounds yeah yeah <laughs> it didn't last very long it was a blessing in disguise absolutely yeah. it, it usually is it usually yeah. is so so now you're you're so you're 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 at PC right or you're you, you left PC or right. you know what yep. which one I do so I guess what I'm trying to figure out is when when did the when did the referee bug hit you Well that was actually later on because what had happened is we ended up getting married moved to Las Vegas me and my wife and uh, we're you know we're both really young you know we're trying to reconcile our marriage and and uh, ended up, uh, she stayed there. We were there three years. Worked there on the Strip in Vegas. Uh, and, what did you do at the, on the Strip? Uh, I was a waiter at okay. the Sands Hotel. Oh, wow. Sands wow. Hotel, okay. yeah, okay. 1973. Yeah. And what took you Bo over there? Boxing wasn't big? Uh, no, yeah. boxing was real wasn't, big. In well, fact, no, I, I mean, no, in Vegas. Well, right? no, it was still... Yeah, it was, yeah, it was cooking. It was good. It was, yeah, I okay. went to a lot of... And I would go to the fights. Yeah, okay. I would go down there because I've always been, you know, involved in okay. boxing all, pretty much all my life, really, you know. Okay. Never really boxed that much in amateurs or anything. But, well, you told a story about the Tough Man contest. Yeah, well, it just so happens these cats that I grew up with on the west side, right? Uh, there was about six of us, man. They said, hey, they're going to have a Tough Man contest. Let's go down there, man. It was west side. We're going to whip all these cats. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounded like fun because we were drinking. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll go get them. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, it was at Fifth National Bank. Okay. And I was already about 22, 23 and, you know, I knew how to box a little bit. Right, you know? right. Jack taught me about it. Right. <laughs> but uh, so we, we went down there, and all of us got involved in it. And right away, we were doing good. We're knocking all these cats out. Right, you right. Know, big old 16-ounce clubs because right. we all knew how to fight. Right. But so as we were going on, uh, there was a tournament. Right. And as we started beating guys... Uh, they started getting tougher opponents, man. <laughs> so so I had a, one day I called up Jack. <laughs> I go, Jack, man, I need your help. He goes, well, bro, what, anything you need, bro, whatever. And I go, I need a sparring partner, bro. And he goes, okay. He goes, where are you sparring at? And I said, I'm, I'm downtown over at, uh, at uh, um, Boys Club. And that, you know, we yeah. were down there. So I never forget Jack come down. I hadn't seen him in a while. Uh, yeah. But it was good to see him. He's like my brother, you know. And he came down. And we, we put the gloves on. We sparred for about two minutes, man. Never hit him. <laughs> I, go, I go, Jack, you got to stop moving, brother. I'm not getting any work out of yeah. you because everything I throw, you're slipping and hitting yeah. me. I, none of these guys are that good, yeah. man. This is a tough man contest. Yeah, this is a tough man. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I need to, you know. And he goes, well, I don't like you, I'm not going to let you hit me, uh, uh, Wheelow. <laughs> and, and I said, well, that's good. So uh, Jack wasn't my sparring partner anymore. I didn't give much of a yeah, workout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, boo -boo. So you know, the ironic thing about it is it went on. It was like uh, four months. 
And I think oh, I shit. had like 16 fights. Damn. Uh, I ended up winning the, I won my deal. I, I, I knocked everybody out but one guy. Oh, that was the, wow. Yeah, actually, it was the last fight and it was really weird. And, and we championship fight, and, and this cat was undefeated and I was undefeated. It was a black dude. He's half black, half Mexican from Peoria. And he was talking all that shit yeah. and all that. <laughs> and all my boys from the West Side was with me and go, man, you got to knock that brother out. Yeah, get him. Because he's him. talking too much shit. I go, I'm on it. <laughs> I got him. Yeah, nice. And I broke my hand in the first round. Oh, yeah. there it is. And my stepfather was in my corner. Uh, and he was in my corner. He goes, you hurt your hand? I go, yeah. He goes, I'm going to stop the fight. I said, no, don't stop the fight. I'm, I got him. Right. I'm going to get him. Nice. And so it, it ended up in the second round, uh, I hit him and knocked him down Whoa. with the left hook. And I was actually better with my left hand and my right. And he got up and the referee pushed him. Or excuse me, he got up and he pushed the referee. So the referee oh. hit him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this, I had to tell the story yeah, yeah. because this was a part of uh, me bo- being involved in boxing. And so as soon as he did that, uh, they disqualified him. And this was for this was for all the marbles. It was wow. for the championship, man. They had trophies about five foot tall. We ended up, they disqualified him. Thank God, because I had a broken hand. And uh-huh. I already told him because after the fight, he was like, oh, man. But I go, well, let's go out. Let's go outside, finish it up, bro. Yeah. You want to still talk shit? Because that's how we did it back yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. You know? And I still wanted his ass, you know? But uh, it was a good thing because I had a broken hand. I ended up <laughs> shattering it, man. I had oh, to really? put a pin in and all this. And it, it, it was crazy. They had a barroom brawl inside the inside <laughs> the place, man, because all my buddies from the west side were, were there. Yeah. From like Carl Hayden. And then all these cats from Peoria was there. So they were all talking shit. So guess what happened? It was a barroom brawl. Yeah. Right yeah. It was, the, it was yeah. the original smoker. Yeah. It, was a, it was, bro. Hell yeah. Yeah. So then I, after that, it took me about a year to And after that, I started thinking I was a boxer then. You know, I'm a boxer now, man. Yeah, well. And so I started going to train the top level, which is one of the top gyms around town. Uh, at the time, Jerry Cheatham was there, oh, white yeah, boy. Yeah. School, yeah. Schoolboy Jerry uh, Cheatham. Schoolboy Jerry Cheatham. Yep. Uh, let's see. Uh, what was a black dude's name? Because I used to spar with him all the time. Edgar Bad News Wallace. Ah, oh, Bad News And Wallace. I was his sparring partner because we were about the same size. And he was a southpaw. And he was a badass. Yeah, yeah, And yeah. there was this other cat in there. And he was a fireman. Anyway, he, they were all, we'd get in there. And those guys all had boxing experience. Right. I was just a pretty good athlete. Right, That's right, all I right. had. And, and, but Pavel, he was an old uh, German dude. He walked around. You remember Pavel Quinton? Yeah. And so Pavel was the trainer, and right away he said, oh, okay, uh, you know, uh, Melton, you know, get in there with those guys. And I go, man, I'm, I'm sparring over here. I'm sparring with all these bad dudes, man. <laughs> <laughs> and I go, I know what's going to happen here. They go, they shattered my hand. Yeah, 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 wait a minute. Is there a timeout here, man? And we got in there, and I actually did pretty well. I mean, nice. I didn't, like, beat any of them, but, you know, I, I could hang Kept with them, bro. Yeah. I could yeah. hang with Kept them. You know, and most of it was because I was in really good shape. Right, right. You know, in really good shape. And... Uh, and I sparred with him. And then this is the, probably the end of my career. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say this. So one day, uh, Pavel says, uh, Kronk's Jim's coming over here. Oh, Tommy Hearns, Tom, uh, Emmanuel Stewart. Is, is a matter Emmanuel Stewart, exactly. Yeah. And he goes, hey, Melton, you're going to spar. You're sparring with Hearns. <gasps> Hearns had just won the welterweight championship of the world. The Hitman? The Hitman. Oh, man. Yeah, man. yeah the Hitman. Watch out for his and right hand. So I told Cheatham, <laughs> I said, Cheatham, man, I, I'm going to knock Tom's dick off. Right on. <laughs> I said, I got him. <laughs> he goes, you got him, bro. Get out you of my got way. Him. Get out of Cause, my way. Because yeah. uh, I was weighing about 165. Tommy fought at 47, right. but he walked around about 65. He's a little taller than me. Yeah. I'm like 5'11". He's like 6'1". Yep. But, you know, I said, this is my chance. Yeah. Because now I get to spar against the champion of the world. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Whole another level. It went, yeah, it, well, the level didn't last too long, brother. <laughs> because right away, man, we got in there. It was a sparring shot, and I started hitting with some jabs, and I had had a good left hook. Right. So I little, do a little, you know, I throw jabs, a couple little faint, and I threw, threw a little, little fake right, and he put his hand, and I hit him with the left hook, right in the liver, dude. And I'll never forget, man. He went, woo! <laughs> Okay, Wes, it's on now. Oh, yeah. I said, oh, shit. I, fucking hit, I hit Tommy too hard, man. And so, boom, boom, boom. And he threw this left hand. I'll never forget. He threw it right down the middle. 
and I didn't even see the right right behind it. Oh. <laughs> and it caught me, man, right on my jaw. And we had headgear, 16 ounce gloves, yeah. out mouthpiece. And he hit me so hard, man, I was on skates. So I kind of grabbed the rope and then he hit me with the left hook. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, I just sit. And I remember my mouth was bleeding. I thought he knocked my teeth out. Yeah, oh, and that was, I bet. To this day, I mean, I've been in street fights, cold cocked. I ain't never been hit that hard, bro. I'm wow. going to tell you, I ran into a right hand that was, it was the same right hand that uh, he knocked Durant out with Dude. that right hand i didn't even see it no that was he had one of the best right hands in the history of boxing he did man. well i felt it <laughs> wow that's, and i that's decided a, that's, that's when i decided i'm not gonna be a boxer <laughs> your no lips more still your lips still <laughs> yeah, yeah well, my tooth and almost knocked my tooth out man he ended yeah. up coming out later knock you know, my tooth came out later after that damn and that's really? with 16 ounce gloves and headgear 16 ounce gloves headgear yeah damn yeah that was my claim to fame boxing oh yeah, man uh, that, yeah. that, that's that's pretty you're decent yeah Said he did. He, Dude, did. he knocked out a lot of. Yeah. Well, though he couldn't knock out Hagler. No, yeah. Hagler got it. Hagler got it. That was the best three rounds of boxing, arguably. Oh, right? Dude. Right. Yeah. It was like three, what, yeah. nine yeah. minutes of war, or whatever. Oh, it, was. Yeah. it was great. Incredible. It was great. Straight off so, the... so sixteen ounce gloves. For, this is again for our audience. Big fat gloves, right? Right. They training usually, gloves. They use training gloves. They usually use nine ounce or yeah, eight, eight or ten. Eight or ten. Yeah, and eight through and ten. That's what people don't understand. Sixteen is sixteen big are big, but you know what? There's been more people knocked out with sixteen ounce gloves than eight or eight or ten because you're sparring with those. Now they even have eighteens. Well, really? Those wow. in the gym wow. now, yeah, there's some like the heavyweights are wearing eighteens because you don't want to get hurt where you're sparring. Right, you're right. In the gym. So you, you definitely could be knocked out with the... And, you know, and then they're heavier, so, you know, it right. helps with your hand speed, I guess, you know? Right. That's crazy. That's crazy. Dude, to get hit by Tommy Hearns, that's fucking awesome. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. So that, yeah. That's a cool story. That's I mean, a that's, cool story. That's 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 I got, that's I got fame, pictures yeah. of it, too. I got pictures of all that. That's you know, awesome. Right? So You still cool. got that tooth? Uh, no, the tooth is gone. I got a fake one now. You got it's whiter than the rest of them. Uh, uh, I said, hey, right let's here. make sure this one stands out. Can I, can I make a gold? They go, no, man. I put a Only brothers can do that, man. Yeah. You got to have the white tooth on. <laughs> Ting. So, so, was that the end of your boxing career? But that was the end of my boxing oh, career. Oh, and then, Tommy you know, Sorry. but I always had boxing in my blood. I loved it, man. Right on. It was just something about it, man. And it was so cool. And Ultimate competition. It, I, right? You yeah, knock me out, I'll knock you out. Exactly. Let's see what and there was this kid I met in high school. Uh, he was a wrestler from West High, and his name was Steve Lopez. And uh, we played football against each other. He was a badass, and he was a good wrestler. Well, I wrestled in the state tournament in my junior, senior year, and, and uh, we got to know each other. We're different weight classes. So one day I met him. He was singing at a bar. <laughs> he goes, what are you doing, brother? You still in shape? And I go, yeah, I play a little racquetball. We play football on Sunday, Sunday bunch. Everybody yeah. would play. We all go to the parks, all of us. No man. pads. No, dude, no pads, <laughs> no, but beer and weed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and brothers were knocking your dick up. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You couldn't walk for three days after that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah right here. Butler School. Butler's Isaac yeah. School. Yeah. 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 We, used to, we you know, played there ourselves. Yeah. yeah, right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, but she said, uh, you know, man, he goes, uh, you still, you box at all? I remember you boxed, man. You were pretty good at it. Yeah. I go, no, man. You know, I did the tough man thing. <laughs> you know, you, Can I tell you my Tommy Hearns story? <laughs> <laughs> and so we started talking. He goes, uh, you know, why don't we uh, open up, try get a boxing gym, start one maybe, and we can open it up for kids and, and bat, you know, places where you know kids, right. there's a lot of trouble. Give them an opportunity. Right. Yeah. So um, there was a there was a bar on 18th Avenue uh, in Van Buren, mm -hmm. and it was called I believe it was called the Niagara. Uh, the, the, the bar had closed. So we said we both and both was actually doing pretty well. I had a okay. business. I was doing pretty good, okay, okay. and we we're making a little bit of money. And so uh, we went and talked to these cats that owned it, and we said, hey, we'd like to turn this bar into a boxing gym. Mm. And they said, really? Said, okay. And I said, uh, you know, me and my partner, well, blah, 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 it's a you know, five-year lease. They said, we're going to have to have a minimum five-year lease because we're going to have to put a lot of money into it. Right. So long story short, we got it. Uh, we we put the money uh, over 100 grand, maybe 150 no out of our pockets. Right. Wow. wow, wow. Me and Steve Lopez. And we opened up a gym. Well, we needed a top trainer. So I had met this guy named Gino Segura. And he was one of the trainers for the uh, USA boxing team. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I had met him a long time ago and stuff. And he had asked me about if I thought about going pro as a boxer. <laughs> was, You're a white boy. Hey, you come out. And I said, no, Gino, I'm not gonna, that's not me. And we Let me show you my tooth. <laughs> yeah. You see this tooth? <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, so I said, look, we want to open this gym, and we want you to run the gym. 
And he, and he said, cool. He goes, well, can you help me? Because I know you know boxing. And I said, yeah, I'll help you. And I said, i got some other cats that will. Steve didn't know too much about boxing. He was more of the administrative part of it. Because okay, our right, idea was part, to open yeah. it up, maybe turn it into a nonprofit. Right, you know, yeah. And uh, you know, our motto was an alternative to drug abuse and street violence. Nice. Because that's nice. what was happening there. And any kid no matter how old, could come into our gym and it didn't cost them a penny. Nice, nice. nice. That's, that's, that's good. That's yeah. good for the soul. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. so that's where it started. And uh, we went on there for a couple of years. It was doing really well. And uh, we had several guys that I went to high school with, uh, George Eros, we called mm -hmm. Chick. Mm -hmm. And Jack had came down to my gym and we all just hung out, man. It was cool because we're all in a boxing and mm -hmm. we're helping these kids, bro. And these kids were, uh, I mean, there were some hoodlums, brother. They'd be bringing guns. I couldn't believe kids 10 years old ain't going to put my nine here. <laughs> hey, Wes, my... Wes, what's the name of the gym? It was, it, then it was called Tough Side Box. Tough Side Box. It was the nice. very first. It's been Madison Square Garden. Yes, sir. Yeah. Oh, I do now it's called Madison. Central yeah. Gym. It's still there. Yeah, it's still there. there. As a matter of yes. fact, the gym's a nice gym if you guys ever want to. It is. Yeah. 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 Got big old murals on the side, on the, yeah. on the, on the wall. Well, Tommy was there. Yeah, yeah. So another guy, uh, uh, Tom Garcia, he would come over there. Uh, Dodie Garcia, I talked about earlier. He was a wrestler. His older brother was into boxing, and I believe Dodie did fought too back in the day. And uh, so Tommy would go there. In fact, when the the cats had bought it out, it was Madison guys, and they left, and then somebody else bought it. And then Tommy Garcia, this other buddy of mine that I went to high school, he ran it. So what happened? I got in a big argument with the cats that owned it. Because uh -huh. what they were doing, they they said, hey, if we let you stay there, there was two dudes that owned it. And uh, they they said, we want to have access to your gym. And I said, yeah, you guys can come in, work out, blah, blah, blah. But what they didn't say was they would come on the weekends and they would party in there. There'd be beer, beer cans and weed, uh, you know, yeah, weed. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we all went through the weed thing right, and right, drinking right. and all that. But <laughs> we're talking about athletes. We don't need no beer. We don't need no weed yeah, in yeah. the gym. Right. It's a sanctuary. Yeah, that's right. Right. That's right. And the gun's got to be in the locker. We locked him up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I talked to these cats a couple of times, man. Matter of fact, it got pretty heated. Oh. And one time, man, we're going to throw blows. I said, you, come, you can't come into the gym no more. Oh, what do you mean? I, and I said, he can't come in no more. Well, what was that? I said, because, you know, you guys are partying and you're leaving beer. You're not respectful. Right. You leave weed. Right, right. Turn our air conditioning up. Our reel's going up. I said, you ain't coming. Well, who says? I said, I, well, you got them right here. I said, every day, come down there. I'm, one of us is going to get our ass whooped. I mean, it's just you ain't coming no more because... So nice. I mean, you stood up for your principles at that point. We right? did, man. We did. And I met one of the nicest guys in the world because we ended up having a lawsuit over it because we had all this money involved in it. Right, right. And I remember this attorney here, and I'm going to say his name because he's such, his name was Al Flores. And he was one of the top Hispanic attorneys in Arizona. In fact, he was the head of the Hispanic Attorney Association. And he was these other cats' as lawyer. I just went into this, uh, to this uh, deposition by myself. So this, the Al Flores was in there, and these cats were there, and we're there in the mediation, and we're telling our story. So I told my story about the kids, man, and right. what we were doing, and all this, that, and other. And I told about these two cats right here. This is what they were doing. And I said, I told them they couldn't do it no more. Well, they, well they, uh, didn't they have an agreement to come in there? I said, yeah, they had an agreement. But the agreement was to be a gentleman right, and right. to treat our place, you know, respectively respect, yeah. and don't be doing that. So when I said finally it came, it was going to be blows, you know, and so we decided to handle it legally. And it was a trip. So we had the deposition and we're leaving and shit. And this dude, Al Flores, their attorney, he, he walks over and goes, hey, bro, he goes, can I talk to you for a minute? I said, yeah, sure. I was kind of pissed yeah. off. Yeah. Yep. And he goes, hey, man, <clears throat> I really like what you're doing over there for them kids, man. He goes, you, he goes, that's really cool of you guys, man. He goes, you know what I'm going to do? He goes, as of today, I'm, I'm getting out of this case here. I'm telling him I'm, I'm not going to represent him no more. And I'm going to come and join you. Wow. And, and wow. He said, but I can't join you on this case because I'm just going to get out of it. But this is the attorney's name that I need you to call. And he'll take care of all of this for you because they'd represent you. Mm -hmm. And from that day, and, and then he says, and then I want you to let me know what I can do to help you, like, do, buy gloves, bags, you know, things like right. that. Because we were Sponsor. putting all this out, right. out of our pockets, you yeah. know. Hey, well, tell you what, we're, we're, stick, on, stick on that topic, right? We're going to take a quick break, and we'll come back, pick it up right there. Because, I mean, it, it's a testament to, to, to your ethic and, 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 and your morals, right? With that attorney jumping off their case and onto your side. So we'll take a quick break, and we'll come right back and pick it back up. Got it. Fair enough. Got it. Sounds Got great. It. I know. 
And the man in charge at the sound of the bell, Mr. Wes Melton. We are back from break. We're picking it up here with uh, Mr. Uh, Wesley Melton. So we left off. We were talking about you were in a lawsuit over the gym because the dudes weren't respecting the gym. They weren't respecting the sanctuary and their party and doing all that bullshit. So you went to court. Their lawyer jumped off their case. Ended up, ended up, uh, you know, coming on our side. He couldn't represent us because he was conflict of interest there but he gave me a, a, a attorney's name that was specialized in uh, in mortgages and and rentals and stuff and gave us a name to a guy that could represent us and then from that day on he started coming to the gym and donating money time uh, as a part of our group because uh, he, he thought it was a good idea it's Sponsorship. a great yeah it, it's a great idea so here's my question um so the dudes that were disrespecting the gym did they did they buy in financially into the gym and that's why they were allowed to use it or they were just they just hit you up to use the gym? Well, no, they, they actually own the property. They oh, the they own the property. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay, we, were, we were renting from them. Okay, we, okay, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. So then they were just kind of muscling in, hey, let's use the gym. They're, they're yeah. the landlord, well, they basically. would come there after we closed, you know, and we were there and they would come and party and stuff. You know, it was their party place. All right, you know, right, they, right. You know, they wouldn't come down there to work out and hang out with the kids. They just came there to party. Ah, so they were just hiding we had out two, We had two bedrooms upstairs over there, if you ever yeah, seen the yep, place. Yeah, stairs, yeah. Yeah, we, we designed it to have uh, world training camps there. Like, when fighters oh. go into a championship fight, they go to training camp. So when you bring people in, you have to bring in sparring partners as well. So a big expense would be is that they have to put them up in a hotel or something. Right. So we had uh, sparring partners come and stay there at our gym because we had two two rooms that were completely furnished because we wanted to make it into a professional training camp there. And, oh, and we ended okay. up doing that. Yeah, that's dude, I didn't even think about that. That's pretty yeah. cool. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. So what happened with the with the with the lawsuit or whatever? I mean Well the, the lawsuit ended up that uh, you know we, we we couldn't really settle with them so we sued them to get the money we invested okay. plus uh, relocating us okay. because it cost it was going to cost a lot of money to take our stuff and go find something else and but we were there for about three years it was actually about three to four years it was a five-year lease with another five-year option so we we're there a while we are mm -hmm. we shoot by my third year our boxing team was the number one boxing team in the state wow i already wow, had wow. like three state champions and, and, and how old were you about that time well, what was the year? Yeah, yeah, 19, what was, I guess, yeah. 1990. So we'll okay, have to 1990. do the math. I'm good at the right. gazentas, man. But I ain't good at that. <laughs> yeah, because you know what? Yeah, how old are you? Yeah, I went to Carl Hayden. Yeah, yeah, they didn't yeah, teach us yeah, nothing over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Carl Hayden said, You in sports, you don't have to go to school. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, the wrestling coach signed you up for a PC class. <laughs> hey, so, so you said you, you, you made a, you, the comment earlier that you had a business. And then you started the gym, correct? Right. And so the, I'm assuming you still were running your business and correct. trying to do the gym at the same time? Okay. Yeah. I, uh, my, I grew up in the radiator business. My father, my grandfather, my uncle had a radiator business okay. in, in, in uh, Midtown Phoenix okay. by downtown. And uh, so when it, in the summers, I'd go work in my dad's shop. Okay. And uh, it was right by uh, uh, on Central and uh, Grant. Okay. You know, right mm -hmm. downtown, south of the uh, underpass, if you guys know where that is. And so uh, when after I got divorced and, and came back to Phoenix, I came back to run my dad's shop and we started growing. I had a bunch of guys from Carl Hayden working there, a bunch of <laughs> right on. Alfred good Reyes, workers, his brother good was working there, good Mark Walton, the best all workers in the world. All the man. best workers, <laughs> man. And they were all Chicano. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 And, and so. Uh, Two tacos and a 12 yeah, pack yeah, and you're done. Right. Moon was there too. Yeah, Moon was yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. And so. Uh, and I worked for my dad, built the business up into a really good business. And and uh, my dad, you know, he's like, he wanted all the money. What the hell are these Mexicans I, doing I, here? I got to get, I don't know, but we built it up and it was good. So I finally decided to go start my own shop. Okay. And okay. I, so uh, around, uh, let's see, 1980, 
I started my own shop in Mesa. I didn't want to have to compete with my dad. Okay. So I went out to Mesa, didn't know nobody. I was a Catholic, and they're all Mormons. So it was <laughs> like, are you a brother Mormon? <laughs> I go, no, Catholic I'm Catholic. Well, you ain't getting our business. <laughs> Let's just start going to church over here, boy. Are you so, getting on a mission? <laughs> So it was tough out there, man, but uh, worked real hard, man, day and night, seven days a week, and got that going, and by about the fourth, fifth year, I was making really good money, and that's when I said, hey, you know what, let's go open up a boxing gym, man. That's I awesome. I still had that little thing in me, and that's when I opened it up in 1990, and, uh, and that's how I got, you know, got back into that, that boxing deal, you know? You know, that, that's awesome. I say you were in charge of the kids. I mean... You're, you're a philanthropist, you know, because I mean, you, you gave back, and, and I and I believe that in life. If, you, if you're in a position to help people out and give back a little bit, give back, and then you were able to do it in something that, that, that you were passionate about, right? Boxing. I mean, I think I think that's awesome. I think that's very unique. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want I want to ask, where do you think that true passion of boxing came from? Like, I, I know you dabbled in uh, it a little bit from but, getting my ass whooped all the time. Uh, my, yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. My dad, my dad, making you spar Jack. Well, yeah, he did. <laughs> and then my mom, she put me in a boys' club, but she didn't tell me it was all black, man. It was <laughs> There weren't even no Mexicans there, brother. It was the whole brothers there. Was that the one on so, it, Yeah. It, it was, uh, it's called, it's called uh, what was it called? It's right off 17th Avenue in Lincoln over there. IG oh, Homes yeah, Boys, yeah. IG Homes Boys, Boys Club. And I remember going there, man. When you got blonde hair and blue eyes, because you're going to get whooped every day. And they beat me. Up. I was a drum. They yeah. beat on me every day. <laughs> yeah, was a yeah. Yeah. But, you know, what, what was the trip was is you know after a while you know i throw a little cheese yeah. back at him man yeah. and you know i wouldn't win in no fights but yeah, yeah you give it, as good as you take it, yeah that was it and and uh and he, so really is where uh, other than with jack and these guys uh, they got they said you're a tough little guy why don't you get in our little boxing team i go yeah coach it's good yeah, yeah. so by about uh, about 10 years old 11 years old I started training in boxing there, uh, okay. and they taught me how right. to box. And there was some really good black fighters there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so I learned to, with because they were so mobile, and I'd be like trying to throw, and they would run, and I would like yeah, boom, because <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you couldn't hit them. Yeah. You're like Jack, Jack, let me hold you so I can hit you. <laughs> so uh, that's where it kind of got going, you know. And I, I got in that it, that the little thing, you know, to box. You know? Nice. Yeah. So. This is, you said the gym, how the gym was over 90. for 90? 90. 90. So 1990, we opened the gym up. And okay. so what? So after we got bought out, we moved it to way south Phoenix down by St. Catharines. Okay. Down there on yes. the south side, uh, mm -hmm. there, there was a little, uh, I bought we, I bought a, uh, a yellow front store down there. Yellow front was big back then. Right, yeah. yeah. Levi's. Yeah. yeah, by the racetrack. Yeah, by then, I was already training pro fighters. Really? And so, man, I had Camacho come in there. I had some Hector. big names. Yeah, Hector. Uh -huh. I, yeah, I was with Jimmy Montoya. Jimmy Montoya was right my on. mentor as a trainer. He was, um, and he trained Camacho. Yeah. I had a fighter named Tony the Tiger Balthazar, if you remember uh -huh. him. Tony yeah. You know? Uh, yep. Another guy uh, from from Eloy would have been really really good, but the brother liked to do drugs more and train. Mm. But uh, what was his name? Uh, the unfortunate story about a lot of fighters. But so it was cool. The USA boxing team came to my gym because they had the box offs. They were at uh, the point in South Mountain. So Hector, or not Hector, but Oscar De La Hoya was oh, on that team. Oh, Way back wow. in the day, yeah. And well, it's like 84 then. Yeah, about 84. Yeah, exactly, because yeah, yeah, yeah. they boycotted yeah. in 80. And so they all came there. So I got to know all these cats. And sooner or later, you know, I did that. But it was so much, bro. Our our gym just grew so much. And I had this business still. Still right, have my business. Right. And the business had taken off. So finally, uh, and I had a partner then. My brother-in-law, I bought out my friend Steve Lopez. My brother-in-law became a partner of mine. Him and his wife got divorced, so he had to leave, and he moved on. So I had the gym by myself, still had my business. I had, like, 40 people working for me out in Mesa. Mm. And so even though I had good people working there, uh, it was too much. Right, right. So I had to close my gym. The hardest thing I ever did, man, because it was the most rewarding thing that I had ever did. Because these cats, all these kids, you become like their dad. Yeah, Sarah, yeah. a lot right. don't have that. Yeah. yeah, surrogate dad. That's exactly right. right. And, uh, man, it was a hard to do that. It was uh, because, you know, we had these relationships. And still today, I see these guys that are end up being pros that right. used to come to my gym. And That's awesome. Hung nice. out. Yeah. Yeah. So. You're the Mick of Phoenix. Hey, Mickey. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah so That's cool. That's a good story. Yeah. So after all this happened, um, Earl and Mary Rose Wilcox uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. had a gym right downtown Phoenix. They opened up one. And it just so happened. Tommy the politicians. Tom, 
Yes. Oh, yes, the politicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They have a little restaurant down there uh, right, by Grant, Grant Park. El Portal. Yep. And, and I knew the guy who was training fighters. His name was, was Tommy Garcia. And he went to Carl Hayden. Okay. And uh, his, his brother's Doty, and, and me and Doty oh. wrestled together. So Tom was there, and I. Tom and the Tom, bomb? Tom the bomb. <laughs> and so I said, and I said, Tom, I said, man, uh, you need any help over there, bro? And he goes, what do you mean? I go, I just thought I'd come and help you, man. You know, kick it, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, he goes, yeah, man, let's come on down. And, and so I started helping him. And uh, Tom was a pretty good trainer, man, yeah, and yeah. and we kind of combined a little bit. We'd bump heads a little bit, me and Tom. He was kind of a character, <laughs> and uh, and so uh, I I started doing that for a couple years, and we were doing personal training and all this. And me and Tom actually bumped heads quite a bit, but he was a great guy, right? He was a right, super right. good dude. Our philosophies were a little bit different. Sure. You can't put two coaches, or it's like right. two cooks in the same kitchen, right? Right. Because right. we all have different styles, right? Right. And and my style was a little different than his so we would argue about how we were going to train these fighters you know and and so but we you know it was cool it was right. just uh, you know i just needed to have my own gym and because tommy was running this so he was the dog right right you know right. so i had to go buy that but what happened <clears throat> john montano he was the director of arizona state boxing came in our gym one day he'd been around forever and he knew i was a trainer and all this and he goes hey man he goes have you ever thought about being a referee mm. i go referee boxing referee he goes yeah i said what, what do you mean he goes well he said uh we really need some we got some older cats that are going to retire he goes uh i said well you know I've, I've never had any amateur experience man is a yeah and he goes well they and i go they just walk around up there anyway don't they <laughs> <laughs> sometimes they do <laughs> he looked at a lot of people honestly yeah, yeah no yeah. yeah they still think that too. i get asked right. that all the time you guys just walk around up there yeah you know? uh -uh. Now, i like the ones that do walk around just let them fight man <laughs> well that's Come it on, fight. Well, that's yeah. part of it walk way, around ref. and stay out of the stay out yeah, of the yeah. fight no way ref <laughs> so John said, uh, I said, he goes, well, I don't want you to have experience. And I huh. go, what do you mean? No amateur experience? He goes, no. He goes, because every time I get somebody that comes up from the amateurs as an amateur boxing referee, then I got to break all these habits because it's so right. much different between amateurs and pros. So when you're refereeing all these amateurs, because as a pro referee, it's all reflex, bro. Right. Yeah, because you don't got time to think, so you better be, you better be on it. And the only way you can do that is to practice that. Right. But if you, so if you're practicing amateurs, which is night and day, they're part of the fight. They right, stop. Right. It, right. Right. I say they don't do this, do that. They're in sign of the cross. You know, hope to make, you know, <laughs> and do. yeah. So they're, you know. So he said, "I'm going to make you referee." He goes, "You're you're a good athlete. I like you, man." I'm and what gonna, year was this? Probably around uh, 95. Okay. You know, okay. You no, know, yeah, maybe a little bit later, 98, 99, because I didn't start refereeing professionally until about 2003. Okay. Okay. So uh, he said, I want you to join the commission. I'm going to have you shadow. The great Bobby Ferrara, mm -hmm. boxing re referee from Arizona. I've heard the name. Yeah. Nationally He's known. He's from Tucson. Yep. And uh -huh. he was bad. I'm telling you, man. You he know, was a gentleman. Go ahead. Right. Actually, he uh, came out with a book. Oh, did he? Yeah. yeah, he did. Yes, he has a book. Yes. Uh, a refereeing book? Refere yeah. Uh, yeah, about his uh, stories and yes. what he's witnessed in the ring and that type of thing. Yeah, he did. Yeah. And, and he was my mentor. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. And, and But it was a trip because when I got on with the commission, there was another guy, attorney, well-known attorney in Arizona. His name was Aaron Kaiser. And he was very involved in the IBF, International Boxing Federation. Mm -hmm. And he, he said, so you're going to be a referee? And I go, yeah. He goes, why don't you join the IBF, bro? You can go to these seminars and they'll teach you about refereeing and, and judging, whatever. So I joined that right away. And I was still practicing uh, shadowing, mm -hmm, they called mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And I did it for like two years. I wasn't get, you know, I was like getting frustrated because I would be in there working out every day, dude, trying to do this and that. And it ended up my first, I think my first uh, fights... Oh, maybe it was a little after. But shortly when they actually started refereeing pros in Arizona, they were already giving me world title fights for the IBF. Wow. Really? Yeah. So wow. that was wow. because I, I was doing a little bit of research and I, and I, I looked up at the Arizona Boxing Commission, right? And and it you know it talks about you got to give fingerprints, you got financial yes. disclosure, et cetera. But they don't really talk about what you have to do prior to being licensed. The process. Like, yeah. like, you, the you, process? Have to, you have to do so many amateur fights, yeah. so many this and that. Well, 
You know, and the, the answer to that is, is that, and I tell people, because I get asked all the time, how do you be a referee? How yeah, want to do yeah, that, right. you know, all the time. That's a question. And I said, well, uh, what you should try to do uh, is uh, try to get in USA Boxing okay. and try to be, be an amateur referee so you can get it unless you've got boxing experience. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The best referees end up being guys that are ex-boxers. To right, be for sure. Right. Because they know the game. Pro fighters. Right, game within not, the not, game. Yeah, they, the pro fighters. Right. Because they, it's a completely different thing. And and I would say just start on the amateurs, and then after a while, uh, then you can start working with, at the pros, get on the commission, and donate your time or be a shadow. And uh, so it's a process, right? You know, I was lucky enough that they needed somebody, and this, the the director was willing to train me, and or help me, right? And uh, it's and it's very political. Oh, I bet. Yeah, like anything. Like else. anything else. Yeah, you can be the best of the best, you know, and. Uh, and still, if they don't like you or something goes wrong, you know you ain't yeah. getting any advice. Put you to the bottom any. of the list. So, so yeah. I have a question: Does do smokers con- are is that considered amateur? Yes. So yeah. do, do you do you have to do smokers? Is that that's a different class of ref? No, no smokers. What a smoker is? It's an amateur event. Okay. And it's an amateur event where they match up the the kids with age, weight, and experience. That's a smoker. And each one of the gyms in in, in the state or the city, they'll throw a smoker on. And what they do, and they generate money with that for their gym, USA Boxing, which which you you can belong to if you have a gym. Uh, They pay for the uh, insurance uh, Mm -hmm. and and help you at the gym. And then uh, uh, USA Boxing, everybody donates their own time, so you don't pay them. So when you throw the smoker on at your gym, you charge everybody to come in. Sure, right. And then you have to find a sponsor. Uh, The sponsor buys the trophy. So we always had it if you fought, if you made weight to fight – even if you lost or you won, you got a trophy. Gotcha. So we'd have a winner. Right, right, and right. They do that. They're still doing that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So smokers is only in amateurs, and it's actually done, uh, you know, through the USA so, boxing. So, so is that how a referee would get his experience, his or hers experience, is working these smokers? Correct. Okay. So they're, they're, through through USA boxing. Correct. They're, they're pulling refs from USA boxing correct. to do these smokers, correct. in addition to an amateur fight outside of a smoker. Correct. Okay. Okay. Correct. Okay. All right. And so I'm an amateur referee. Now I want them to go pro. Right. So I have to go through a whole different process? So what you have to do is you have to contact um, the Arizona State Boxing Commission. Right. Okay. And uh, you can apply for a license. And uh, then this, it's a big form you fill out on mm-hmm. what kind of experience you had as an amateur fighter, a pro fighter, whatever you may have, any kind of experience in boxing. But there's so many people that apply unless you've got a really... It's like any big job. Got it. Is that if you don't have somebody that in the know, it's political. Sure. Right. So, right. so yeah, yeah, unless you were, you've been amateuring, uh, refereeing and box, uh, pro, uh, amateur fights for years... And you built up your name, and everybody mm-hmm. knows who you are. Got it. Yeah. But but then there's the thing we were. T- I was talking about originally. Then you have to break those habits of being an amateur referee mm. versus a pro referee. Right. 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 And then there's another level. There's a championship referee. So there's a lot of referees that referee all over the United States and the world and never become championship referees. That, that's what I was going to ask. Somebody here, a referee, he, this is his his or her, you know, 30th profession, uh, 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 title fight, you know, they refereed. So do you have to get, like you start, you start with the IBF. That's Correct. where you broke in. Yes. So, so at that point, do you have to... Do you get certified by the IBF? And so do you get certified by the WBC, WBA, et cetera, Good question. et cetera? So if you're going to referee a world title fight for one of the four sanctioning bodies, mm-hmm. IBF, WBO, WBC, mm-hmm. uh, you have to be, it's, it's a certification. Mm-hmm. How you do that is you go to their conventions. Mm-hmm. They have a convention someplace in the world, around the world, and you have to pay yourself to go to the wow, convention. Next question. So every one of the conventions, they'll have a referee seminar, They'll have a judging seminar, and they also have a, what's called a medical seminar, and that's mostly for the referees because they want to teach you how to examine p- uh, fighters. Right, who's see. getting fucked up. Yes, exactly, and, and, and there's levels of that. And it's it's just as important to go to those medicals because then there's telltale signs. Right. Oh, it's like right. a cop, you know, I want to do a sobriety test. Right. Well, it's a sobriety test that you're doing from the time you walk in the dressing room to start evaluating the fighter, how he's asking, you know, how he's answering, responding to your questions. Mm. You're telling him what you expect from him and what he can expect from you and, and how he does that. So you start right when you walk in as a professional referee. The observation starts. The, the, the observation. Exactly. And, right. then you, you, and then you go from there. So this, those pre-fight meetings are c- critical 
Very critical. Right. I would imagine yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to me, if you're going to be successful, uh, you, the, the more information that you can put across to the fighter and the chief second, the guy that's going to be running the corner, right. which is generally his trainer, to let them know exactly what you mean. This is business. Okay? Right. The, and, you know, you have a pre-fight instruction. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. It, you go through. And I, I go into the most common. Th- you can't go through it, everything hypothetically is going to happen. But we'll go over to some of the rules. But I, I, I try to hit on the most common things that are going to happen, like mouthpiece coming out. Okay. You know, or, yeah. or, or how, you, how we're going to, what we're going to do, we're going to stop a fight, how, what the procedure is going to be. Uh, you know, the, the, the fouls. The, this is when I can step, this is when I'm not. And I, you know, tell them, uh, you know, I'm going to stay out of your fight. I'm going to let you, you know, fight your own fight. I'm right, going to use right. verbal commands. Right. So and then, do you ask, like, I guess that's in the medical, right? That's in the medical uh, seminar. The the medical part of is is actually examining um, the the person, you know, how their equilibrium is. Right, what their eyes Uh, look. Their eyes, what their eyes look like, how they're reacting to a punch, how they're moving, how they're slipping a punch, how they're countering a punch, and all of that feeds into the part of when you're going to stop a fight because stopping a fight and professionals. You better know what you're doing, especially if you're out of this country. They'll kill you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. so Wes, I could bring I could bring one up where it it kind of looked like the fighter was winning, but he was taking punishment, and that was the Meldrick Taylor Caesar Chavez fight. Correct. He looked like he was winning, but he was taking a lot of punishment. Correct. And they stopped it in what the last ten seconds. Right. So that. That would be like uh, the, the seminar, right? That would help you see what's 100%. going on. One hundred percent. Yours look closest to the fighter, so you see who's taking the most damage. Exactly. And you hear the punches, and you hear well, the punches that most people. Our don't. theory is you're better off stopping the fight one punch early than one punch too late. Right. Because in our business, they go to the hospital. Yeah. And yeah. sometimes they don't make it. Yeah. And yeah. That, unfortunately. That's, and, that unfortunately. Co- and the responsibility and the liability comes back on the referee because we don't have any insurance. We're we're. Uh, when we fight for these commissions or these titles, we don't have any insurance. So if there's something that happens in the ring and somebody gets hurt, they're, they're going you're, after you. Right. They're li- you're liable, and you. I, I could tell you many stories that I had, and there's some going on as of right now. So it, it, it's curious to me that that if you get certified by the IBF, WBA, WC, whatever, that they don't provide some sort of coverage for the referee, right? Well, yeah, it, it is, and we've talked about that for a long time. They don't have a union, bro. And I think right. if I ever make it long enough, and after I retire because I've talked to all these top referees, been real good friends with them. They need to have that. Not only that, would it provide better referees for you? Sure. But so they're covered. You know, I mean, we right. all, we have insurance. Right, know, right, right, yeah. You know, we, we don't know, you know, all we know is we're judging this person uh, to how they're reacting during the fight. Correct. You know, we don't know their medical history. We don't know if they got a, right. you know, a problem in their brain. Yeah, and, but, you made, and you made that point pretty clear when we were just having an off-camera discussion about the chief second knows their his fighter. fighter better than anybody else, right? right? He knows Correct. if he's training, if he's not training, if he's you know doing dope. You know, he, they know how much know. punishment he can take. Yeah, and, they yeah. know, right. and 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 you put it on them to step in if Correct. the guy's getting hurt. But a lot of them won't, right? Because yeah, they're, they're, a lot of them are in for the wrong reason too, right? I mean, it's a well, paycheck, right? right. Yeah, and so, you, go ahead. Uh, you just unpacked a lot right now. Yeah, you did. And uh, so what? That was one of the questions that I had. So in the pre-fight conference, you talk about what we're going to do if the mouthpiece falls out. Correct. Right. Yeah. So me as a, a casual fan that watches it. Right. I've seen fights where the mouthpiece comes out. They leave the mouthpiece out. They keep fighting. Right. Then I just recently, about two weeks ago, I seen a fight where I thought the the fighter had the momentum was going to knock the guy out and the referee stopped it to put the mouthpiece back in. Right. It's supposed to be a break in action, correct? That's right. There, there's a there's a the rules say when a mouthpiece comes out, mm-hmm. it, 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 when the mouthpiece comes out. You don't have to put the mouthpiece in right away if you still got the mouthpiece. Sometimes it'll go out of the ring. Right. Whatever. You might not even see it, and you might not even know whose mouthpiece it is. Okay, but So after mm-hmm. you locate the mouthpiece, you don't have to stop the fight. And one of my pre-fight instructions is uh, when we come to the mouthpiece part of it, I say, you got a mouthpiece? Yeah. I said, how many do you have? You got one or two? Uh, oh. Well, I only got one. I go, well, you're, you're supposed to have two mm-hmm. because if you lose your mouthpiece during this fight, and you don't have a mouthpiece because sometimes they get knocked out in their audience right. or get lost. The rules say that you have to start a round with the mouthpiece. That's the rules. Mm. You can't don't have to end the round with the mouthpiece, but you have to start the round. So we 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 
the rule is you need to have two mouthpieces. Now, we're not going to let you fight because you don't know. Mm -hmm. But we're going to tell you if you lose that mouthpiece and you don't have it, when the bell rings the next round, you lose by disqualification. Oh. Because, yeah, because a lot of guys get hurt and they'll spit it out. Well, something so, shouldn't, shouldn't it be when it, when it falls on the floor, shouldn't it be washed off? That's a big thing now. Well, here's the, here's what it's a discretion. Because I do see them wipe the gloves off. Yeah, and that's, that's yeah, an and then that's just a you know they that went back to years when they used rosin. Now yeah. it's just a formality to mm. clean the gloves. Although okay. the them rings are really dirty and got all kinds of stuff. Okay. So it, that's yeah. really a formality. I still do that. It's your discretion. I'm an old school cat. I like mm. the formality. It looks good too. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah. You're doing that. You know, you're doing your job. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I was going to go over a mouthpiece real quick with you. So what I would tell him when he's in there, I go, you got a mouthpiece? Yeah. Uh, got one or two? One. Okay. And then explain to him if you lose the one. Now, does that mouthpiece fit your mouth? Uh, yeah. Okay. It's got to stay in your mouth because if it comes out, I got to decide if you spit it out or you got knocked out. If, it, right. if you spit it out, if you spit it out, I'm going to either take points away from you or disqualify right, you. Right, right, right. Okay? So it's got to stay in your mouth. And Chief Second, here's how we're going to handle it. If I can get the mouthpiece, I'm going to pick, pick it up. If the fight is intense, I'm going to let the fight go. I'm not going to stop the fight to put the mouthpiece in mm. if the fight is intense. And then I have another option. If, I, if and when I decide to put the mouthpiece in, I can walk over there and put it in your mouth, or I can call timeout, put the other fighter in the neutral corner, walk you over to your corner. Chief Second, I want you to be ready. If you've got another mouthpiece, I want you to have that ready so you can put it in your fighter's mouth, get him back out there, and he can finish his job. Or um, are you going to have to wait on me to find it, to clean this mouthpiece, find right. it or get it. And so, and, and if you're going to wash it off, I don't want you to give me any instructions or buy him any time. Right. If you do that, I'm going to take points away from him. I'm going to disqualify right. it's, it's, right. yeah, you. You tell the chief second right there, this is what you got to do. The reason I very rarely ever put a mouthpiece in a fighter's mouth without cleaning it, not because of the hygiene part of it, because washing it off ain't doing shit. Right. You know, it really, really not. Yeah, it's really, just a formality. Uh, right. right. Uh, depending on the magnitude of the fight. Uh, you've seen a fight here, uh, Neverette? Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah, when, yeah. Yeah, the Neverette ago. fight. Fought the white boy from Canada yeah, not yeah, too yeah. long. Chris Flores was the referee. Right. Good friend. Like my, 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 my little brother. He put the mouthpiece in, but he put it in upside down. Mm -hmm. And see, that's one of the problems with putting it in yourself. I was a trainer. These mouthpieces are weird. You yeah, got, they you got know, big old Yeah, so it's real stuff. easy to put them in. Then you're in trouble because in his case, he put it in upside down. It made more time for Neverette, so the cat that had him hurt couldn't go in there and finish his business. Mm -hmm. So right. everybody was like, dude, Neverette had 38 seconds to recover. The cat had him knocked out. Right. And then you let him back and shit. And Chris got in a lot of trouble over that. And he goes, how would you handle he asked me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. For and sure. I said, well, bro, what I would have probably did, because in the back of my mind, I wouldn't I knew it was at the end of that round. And it was so intense and shit, I would have picked it up. Okay. I would have picked it up. And here's how I would have handled it. I would have picked it up. I would have let him go because I knew in the back of my mind it was close to the end of the round. And I didn't I didn't want to break any action. Right. Because I already told him in the pre-fight instructions, you lose your mouth. I'm not stopping the fight to put right, the mouth right. in. If the fight's intense, if there's a break in the action, that's yeah. then I'm going to handle it that way. Uh, so I would have held on to it. Not only that, what I would have did is when it was the round, I would have told him, uh, okay, right at the end of the round, I would have said, time out. Judges, one point deduction, one point deduction, yeah, one point go. deduction, because never right there, he spit it out purposely. Mm, yeah. And I tell him, do you spit it out purposely? Like I told you yeah, in the yeah. pre-fight instructions, if you spit it out, I can either take points away or, or disqualify you. So I would have taken a point away right yeah, then. Right. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. it has to be on that round so the scorekeeper, the scorers can put it in, in their scorecards yeah, for yeah, that yeah, round. And you already, gave, you already gave them the heads up on it. How are you going to But see, it? dude, that's experience. Yeah. You, you know, you just don't do it. I mean, it took me a long time to be able to get to that level. Uh, to that, you know, all these hypothetical situations, how you're going to handle that. So, yeah, ex hang on. We're going to take a quick break again. G excellent insight. We're going to take a quick yeah. break, right? And then we're going to come back and we'll keep going with this. Okay. Or we'll yeah. keep going right with on. this. Right on. Good. Cool. Good. Yeah. We're back. <laughs> we are back. Um, 
We, we have. We left. <laughs> See? Internet, these guys don't take nothing serious. Uh, hey, we're back. We, uh, good insight into the, the pre-fight instructions in terms of the mouthpieces and, and your observation starts there, right? Correct. Uh, with, I, I never would have really thought about it. You know, like I say, you go to the rules. I, do it do it real quick. Do you ever ask like open ended questions, you know, just to kind of see how the fighters I guess general general um well being. Yeah, well being, um mental intellect or anything like that. Not too punchy, I guess. Very first part of my pre fight instructions, we had time, I'd go over it with you. Right. But uh is that how you doing tonight? Yeah. Uh do you have any injuries, anything I need to know about? Okay. So, okay. you know make them talk. If, yeah, make them talk to me. And that's where the evaluation starts. Okay. I want to see how you're answering. Are you slurring your words? Are you you know, it's, you know my evaluation starts right there. Right. A, a good referee, that's where you start. That's awesome. That's awesome. I know Chris, we were talking on the break. You had a, you had yeah, a pretty yeah, interesting yeah, yeah. question. Yeah, so I wanna I'm gonna rewind it back. So now now you're a referee. Do you remember your first championship fight and your first televised fight? And uh how did that go? But hold on. Be before you answer, I think it's important to mention that he has over 433 fights under here. Almost. Yeah, we'll get I bought 445 pro fights, over 60 title fights, mm. oh. and 13 world title fights. Nice. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. okay. So In 17 years. Nice. Right on. So, so your first championship fight, what was that? Who was that? Do you remember that? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Who was it? Who was it? Uh... My first championship fight was in Los Moches, Mexico. Here we go. For the IBF Championship of the World. And it was Julio Cesar Chavez's son. It, wa it wasn't Junior. junior. Oh. It was, uh, I'm trying to think of his name. I, it's just, I lost my he, he was the better of the two. He was he, the better. Uh -huh. Wait, well, he was, I don't he know was if he's smaller. good of his Marcus. dad. Yeah, yeah, he was, yeah, he was, <laughs> yeah, he was better two. than Junior. Oh, yeah, better than Junior. Way better than Junior. Yeah. Uh, it was there and uh, you know in, in Sinaloa and a lot of mafiosos there. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Everybody had big old And my eyes. heart's <laughs> pounding the whole time, brother. Don't stop it. Think, if I stop this fight, I know what they're gonna do. They're it was chicken. pounding for the good reasons, right? All the apart. good reasons, right? It was you know, pounding. Yeah. yeah. So that was my uh, my first world title fight, and it was against uh, Julio Cesar Chavez, younger Omar. 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 Omar Chavez. Right. And he was a really good fighter. So so walk us through. I lost 15 pounds in that fight. You did? And I went to the hospital. Why? Because it was so humid there. Really? I took off my Under boxing the shoes. I could have filled up uh, one of these bottles because I sweat so much. And I wasn't prepared. I didn't know that I needed to be drinking water. You don't see referees yeah. drinking water between rounds. But it was so humid, by the second or third round, they had to come in there and dry the ring off because of all the sweat from the fighters and me. I was soaking wet, and my shoes were, so were filled with water. I lost 15 pounds for just your kid. Wow. Yeah. So well, that, Wes, that was your that was your that was your first that was my uh, first my first world title world title wow. fight. Um, what time of the year? It was in the summertime, you know, down there and, and down there in Los Moches, it's like right by the ocean. Yeah, it's, it's like always the ocean humid and then over the there. That's where the, you know they grow a lot of weed over there. It stays 80 degrees and it's humid but over humid, there. It's jungle. Humidity. It's jungle right there. Yeah, exactly. It's humid, really humid. That's and, uh, the temperature cool. wasn't high. It was just humidity. Yeah. Wow. So walk me through. How a referee gets called for a fight. I mean, what what happens? I mean, say I know you got your certification through the IBF, WBC, WBA, right? You go through all the the the, the medicals, and all the, the the seminars. So, how do you get? I mean, they call you. I mean, walk me through that part of it. Yeah, well, there's two ways you're gonna get a fight. You need to get through the local commission. Okay. You know, if you're part of the uh, local commission as a referee, uh, they'll uh, generally uh, you know email you. And let you know, or they'll, like they'll call me and tell me what they think. We have seven referees in Arizona. I'm I'm the chief referee. Okay, so nice. there's only seven in Arizona. Yeah, really. Mm -hmm. and, and, and championship referees, like you talked about, the different, no. the different levels. That's it. No. Professional. Point blank, professional referees. Only seven. There's Damn. only seven professional. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah. There's only really. Well, I I don't know if I should say it. There's the, there's two other there's there's four of us that's actually referee world title fights out of the seven. Of the seven. Wow. Yeah. Okay. A little more than half. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, generally now, because I'm a chief referee, me or Chris Flores, Chris Flores is another referee that's coming up, and he's he's refereed. So in fact, he's going to end up refereeing the uh, the fight coming up here on the 16th. A Bam and uh, yeah. Sonny? Uh, yeah. He's going to referee. Oh, Bam. Yeah, I was supposed to. I had already uh, got the emails on it from the IBF and WBO. It's sanctioned by the IBF and WBO. So they had actually sent me an email 
about five or six weeks ago about, uh, you know, if, if I'm available. And that's how they do it. The okay. sanctioning bodies will send you an email. Generally, it's uh, it, two or three weeks in advance, although sometimes if another, if a referee falls out or something happens, they'll, you know, it may be only a couple of days. And they'll, and they'll they'll ask you. They don't tell you you got the fight. They'll say, would you be available for this fight? Oh, uh, right. okay. And how it works is wherever the commission is in the world, the sanctioning bodies will give them like three referees that they can pick from and about five judges. And the local commission, the promoter of the fight, and the managers of the fighters decide who's going to work the fight. Who's promoting that fight Which, next week? Uh, Matchroom. Matchroom, uh, Eddie Hearn? Eddie Hearn. Okay, yeah. okay. So, Wes, let's get back to you. So, your your first major fight was in Los Mochis. How about your first uh, on-TV, uh, pay-per-view how did you feel? What was the pressure on you? Uh, well, you, you know, in sports, just being in sports, you, you know, if you got anything inside you, uh, I think you're always going to have this little thing in there. Right. And that little thing is your competitive right. spirit, you know. Um, by the time that I got my first championship fight, I had had several, you know, fights that I'd worked. Even though I still had that little feeling inside, I felt very confident. There okay. we go. Yeah, I was like, let's do I'm it. I'm ready. I'm going. Let's like do it. That. And I've always like kind that. of been like that. You know, uh, you, you got 12, 15, 30,000 people screaming and stuff. You know, that little thing becomes a big <laughs> thing inside. Because <laughs> you're going. So there's no butterfly, no, butterflies involved. Every there's time, no nervousness. Every it's, time, business as usual, let's get it on. I'm going to tell this. you something. Tell every me. time I walk in the ring, I have a butterfly. Every yeah. time. Yeah. Every that's a, time. That, that, that's, that's your competitive spirit. Yeah. That's it is. And to me, if you lose that, then you, you don't have it. I, right. I got that thing every time. When the bell rings, then whoosh, focus. You know, then I can't hear nothing. I the, the People screaming. That's what I was going to ask you. I just West. hear, try to hear the bell. <laughs> you know, yeah. because Do you ever hear the commentators, anybody talking outside the ring? Like, no. Oh, anything? No. Okay. All no. right. Can't hear it. I don't. Okay. Some guys do. If, if that distracts you, you're in the wrong business. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because they're gonna, you're going to get people screaming. At, and I get people, hey, man, didn't you hear me yelling at you? I go, yeah. dude, there was 20,000 people in there. Which one were you? But no, you're just so focused, man. My big deal is is that you're so focused and it's so loud when you're up there. Yeah. Loud. And that whoever the timekeeper is, you know, we have a 10-second block to mm -hmm. let you know 10 seconds to the end of the round. I tell them, beat the shit up. Yeah. Have you ever watched referees when the when they do the 10 seconds, they go like this? Right. Always. You know where that is? They heard it. You heard it. Yeah. When I don't go like that, that means you ain't hitting it right. hard enough. So that's my signal to you is letting you know I heard it. Oh, if wow. I don't do this, then you need to beat the shit out of it the next round. And same thing with the bell. If I if you do the 10 second and I don't go like this, you better hit that bell because I can't hear it. I can't hear it. Yeah. Oh. So, so, so it, speak, is, so is it the same person that holds up the does a picks up no, a count? No, he's sitting right next to him. That's called a knockdown man. Okay. So okay. the knockdown man, if a person goes down, whether uh, and anything touches the ground, but the soles of their feet, it's their job is to start counting, pick whether it's, they think it's a knockdown mm. or not. Anything touches the ground, but the soles of their feet, they they stand up. And they start to count mm. because you, what you have to do as a referee, when somebody goes down, you have to get the other fighter in the neutral corner and make sure he stays there. Generally, it's around three or four rounds. But here's the deal. When you do fights out of the country, you're doing world title fights. They don't have a knockdown, man. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> so so as a referee, down, what I normally do, and sometimes we have them here and I don't use them sometimes. Okay. Okay. okay? You know, it, it looks good. That's what, you know, it helps. Right. Normally I'll do. But if I think I'm going to have any problem, I'll just start at four, five, oh, okay. six, you know, and I'll start my count without having to look like that. And, and, and a lot of the reason why I do that, because out of the country or most places, you don't have a knockdown person. Got it. Got it. Got it. Okay. Got it. That's good. okay. 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 So speaking of the crowd being loud and electrifying, this is a two part question. How do you feel about MMA and uh, specifically UFC? And the fight you did with Jake Paul and Silva, how was the crowd and how was that? How did that, your judgment on that, on that fight? I mean, they're not boxers, they're MMA, but it's they're a show. Because he did, because West did the I Jake Paul, right. um, Silva. Anderson Silva fight. Right, right. Great fight. You know, it's a good question. Uh, it, it, it was really, really cool. Really cool. Okay. A lot of it's because the fighters are really cool, but completely different fans. There we go. Completely yeah. right. different fans, different style, different hype. 
the majority of the fights that I did here, professional boxing matches, it's almost all Latinos. Right. To that fight there, it was almost all white people. Right, right. You know? And they're completely different fans than the Latinos. <laughs> I'm not saying they're any better or worse, right, right, you know, but no. they're different. Right. Yeah. You know, they're just the way that they handle things. I could tell you a lot of crazy things. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, no. Only the guy, I'd have to tell the guys though. Not, <laughs> there's a lady present. But uh, got to know them. It was a credible fight. Uh, these two guys didn't have a lot of boxing skills, obviously. Right. I was going to ask that. But too. they were really tough dudes. Right, right. Tough, tough man. man contest. Yeah, tough man contest. They're fighting, man. When and uh, so that was really cool. That's so does your party judging? Cool does your judging kind of does that dictate your judging style? Is uh, it different? Your refing style? Because you know, like, well, these guys ain't really boxers, but you know what I mean. Well, what you do is if if you get a big fight like that, this is how I prepare. And I think if you're a professional, you, if you're not doing this, you're you're cheating yourself and everybody else. As soon as I hear that I got a world title fight, boom, I'm on I'm on uh, YouTube. And I'm watching on YouTube. I want to see what watching they do. Fight, how they fight. Watch how they act. What, how do they respond? What do they do that I don't like? One of the things I need to talk to them about in the fight. So I make sure that I do my homework. So when we get in there for the fight, I know exactly what I think they're going to do. And it's going to better my chances to do a good job in the ring. Cool. So you awesome. do your research. Okay. Right yes, okay. absolutely. Yeah. Right on. For everyone. So right Wes, on. you got 450 plus fights. What, what what was your favorite fight to referee? Without well, you don't have to one? say too many names. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's a, that's another good question. I refereed in Auckland, New Zealand. It was pretty early in my career. The place was gorgeous, Auckland, New Zealand. I bet. All the blacks were there, you know, the the rugby team, you know. Who oh, yeah. oh yeah. Oh yeah. All yeah, blacks. Yeah, yeah. All those the, the Aborigines Which or Aborigines? the blacks? Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the name of their team, brother. They call them the blacks. But you know what? They're all some bro. If I tell you one thing, if you say, Hey brother, are you black? They go, No, man, I'm Samoan. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, so uh the place, everything about it, it was the IBF uh Champion, uh, eliminator, world championship eliminator. Uh -huh. It was between Joseph Parker mm -hmm. right on. and uh, to come from the UK, big black dude. Uh huh. And that was probably the coolest fight that I've ever did to this day. Why was it the coolest fight? Because they were two big bad Those are big guys. Dudes. And Go I on. refereed read just not long ago. I was telling you about them guys that I refereed six eight, six five. They were over three hundred. So I've refereed some big heavyweights before. But these guys were talented, oh, and, and it was a really close fight. And I was pretty seasoned by then, mm -hmm. and I felt good. Uh, but it was tough, man, because these guys were fighting inside. And as a good referee, you want to stay out of the fight, right? And one of the and I use verbal commands, like so when they tie up, I let them tie up on the inside, but I tell them to work out. I don't want to go in there and break you because you're setting the cat up. Right. You're doing all this work on the inside. If I got to go break you, you're going to start over again. So I'll tell you, uh -huh. listen to my commands. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to tell you, hey, work out, work out. Good. Okay. Well, they weren't listening too much. <laughs> so, and a lot of heavyweights are like that. They hit and hold traditionally. Mm -hmm. And we, I always try to talk about that prior. But it was, it was just a fight to the, to the death, man. Wow. It, they, anything that they could use. And they were doing a lot of things that was illegal. And it was my job, first and foremost, was to make sure they're okay. That safety is right, always first. Right, right, right. But to, to referee it where it was going to be a clean, clean fight. Right. And I was so tired after that fight because I'm pushing these cats, man, and yeah. I'm trying to walk. <laughs> they, they get well when and they were. And this is really not illegal, but one guy would get the other guy to the ropes, so he's putting pressure on him, leaning on him. You're leaning on him, yeah. so in break they can't. They ain't going back, so you got to go break, stick back. And then, so what you got to do is put your hands in there and pants, and you got to wiggle in there so you can walk them. Because you, by the oh. time, after about three rounds of that, you can't even pick your arms up. Yeah, yeah. So you have Big to boys. have different techniques to be able to get in there and separate them. And you want to have a punching distance. If you only separate them this far, they threw one punch and they're back in there again. Right, So right. you've got to separate them out. So if you can't do it on the extension of your hands, you take them and walk them and you walk them with your hand on your chest and walk them. So after 12 rounds of that, I didn't make the after fight party. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, so, so that was your favorite fight to referee. It was um, my. Um, it was, let, let's go back. Uh, who, who's your favorite fighter of all time? Uh, and growing up. Oh, growing it's up. always been number one by far. Um, Roberto Duran. Oh, Roberto. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, Roberto Duran. You know, Manny Pacquiao. If you want to get to the brass tacks, 
is by far probably the greatest fighter to ever live because of all the weight classes that he won. He was like he's, a seven division champ or something like yeah, that, right? Yeah, he's like a 15 time world champion. Yeah. Sugar Ray Leonard was like seven. He's like 15 time world champion. So different sanctioning bodies and different weight classes if you think about that. But De Roberto Duran, when I was growing up, was a little cat. Oh, yeah. Like, he's like Jack and Scrapper, me. too. But, Scrapper, but too. The right. way he fought Marvin Hagler. And, you know, and all the way up there uh, was incredible. Sugar Ray Leonard was right in there, but something about Durant. I mean, I always loved it. It's in black eyes. Yeah, well, and he had that style, man. And, and, and he was old school. He always kept one at home, mm -hmm. you know. And so he could he could parry the shot. He could miss the shot. And it was already right there. And he could he could fight a lot of different ways. And I just, I never got the opportunity to work to referee his fight but I got to be really good friends I got his personal phone number talked to him wow. occasionally wow. and that's probably one of the coolest things is not only my idol but to get to know him well, right. you know, share a story you talked about earlier about do you want to plane with him yeah so we were going to a convention uh, it was an IBF convention it was in Panama mm -hmm. and so we flew from here from Phoenix to Miami mm -hmm. so when we got on the plane to Miami I look up and it's Roberto right on and I go Durant <laughs> what's up brother hey it's me <laughs> he looks up he smiles and he tries to act like he don't know english you know but he knows english real good yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know if you ask him questions he'll answer in spanish but if he knows you he'll talk to you in english and i don't know why because he speaks good english but that's his thing that's his persona yes his persona there you go and he was cool to talk to me man i, I was a new referee then yeah, and to yeah. see my idol man and i'm sitting next yeah. to roberto duran and, and who I'm else was on that plane uh, Chris Flores, a uh -huh. kid from here. Right. Uh, Aaron Kaiser was on that plane. So check it out. As soon as we got off the plane, the neatest thing that's ever happened to me in boxing. So we go to the facility, you know, and there's fans everywhere and shit, and Roberto. And right as soon as we get there, dude comes up in his car, comes to get him, and who comes out? Alexis Arguello. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hell yeah. So Alexis goes, what's up, brother? You know, they embrace, man. They were embracing, and I, I had like tears, basically. I go, bet. Yeah. I was like the two baddest Latinos of all time. And I go, hey, fellas, I'm before here. you leave, I need to get her, <laughs> I need a picture of you guys, man. Hell and yeah. I was with the girl. I took a date, and she was like mesmerized. You know, she was like, she I was love, I love you. <laughs> You're going to get some tonight, baby. <laughs> and she goes, look, that's Roberto Duran. And, yeah. and Guayo, first of all, he looks like a model. Yeah. He's a pretty boy. All the girls love him. I know so how it is. I got them. She, she she took the picture of me and them, and we're all going like this, and I got Not the all. picture. Right. Yeah. Nice. nice. So have that you picture. Ever the Mills Lane? I have several times. Well, that was going to be one of my questions. So uh, we Sorry. talked about boxers. <laughs> Who has been an inspiration, or who's your favorite uh, referee? Yes. Wow. That's a good question. Bobby Ferrar is the one that got me going from here. He was a world-class referee. Most, one of the most classiest men in the world. And he trained me to take his job. That's the guy you were that, shadowing. I was shadowing him. Right. So think about that. I'm doing that now. I'm training these young guys to take my job. <laughs> right, right. But, but, but that's what you owe the sport. Right. Uh, the greatest referee, I have three. Go ahead. Three. Okay. All my buddies are going to be mad at me. Uh, my first for a long time was uh, Benji Estevez. Well, when I was growing up, it actually was Larry Hazard Jr. Yeah, Larry I would say Larry Hazard. Larry, Hazard a lot man. of people don't know about Larry Hazard. Yeah. 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 Larry, you know, I'm not going to go there, but his personality isn't all that great. Okay. But incredible referee. So he inspired me. But the three best to me, and still to this today, Benji Estevez, number one, Raul Caiz Jr. Yeah, I've seen Raul. Mm -hmm. They're little guys. Fights, yeah. yeah. They're little guys, you know. And the third one is Harvey Doc. Harvey, Harvey Dunn. And Harvey. all three yes. of those are really, really good friends of mine. I just got off the phone with Harvey just before I came here. We're really good uh, because I'm going to start refereeing in Las Vegas. I don't know if I should say that yet, but it hasn't been announced. I'm going to start refereeing full time. Announce it now. Yeah. <laughs> you heard it first. Well, hey, okay. Right I'm going to start. Re I, I just Exclusive. got done with my license, so I'm going to be a uh, full time referee in Las Vegas. Here we oh, go. Right on. Here we go. That's awesome. That's awesome. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. Well deserved, Brad. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm going to get in trouble with that problem. <laughs> <laughs> wait there yet, brother. Can you wait? <laughs> Nobody's listening. What that? Yeah. You know what? That, 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 that's great. You talked about how you came up, how you got into, you know, my dad got you boxing with Jack. Uh, and, then, and then the fire was lit, right? The spark was lit. 
and now you're full, you know start a gym right wholesale right giving the kids you know free i mean that, the that's gym, right yeah dude that, i mean that, that's ref. and now you're going full circle man now you're the uh, a, a you're the, the the chief referee in arizona now you're going full now you're in the big show moving I, up moving up that's yeah. awesome yeah, man that's awesome. that is yeah. awesome yeah. man hard work well deserved i want to say you know owed well earned it's incredible it's well yeah, earned it is it is. But still, I work just as hard, if not harder now, than I ever have. I, to me, I'm not, I haven't made it yet. I, right you know, I still have you're the there. passion. You're there for us. You're I, there. Yeah, you're yeah. There. I want, I'm, yeah, you're an inspiration to us. I want to continue to work at it because it's my passion. I don't do it for the money. I just love the sport. I owe it to the sport. I owe it to myself to give everything I can. I was always a little bit heavy. Growing up, I was a little skinny dude. You're husky. You weren't heavy. Yeah. <laughs> My mom said, son, you look really good up there. good referee, but you, you're fat. <laughs> oh, yeah. That mom will tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the pants. pants. It's the pants. It's the pants. Mom, that's what I tell her, Jack. Mom, the TV puts we 10 like pounds, pounds on you. <laughs> yeah. so, we, were, we were like that in high school. He, he, he was Wheelo. Yeah. 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 Wheelo. He's Wheelo. <laughs> well, speaking but of which, that's one of the reasons I blew my back up, because to tell you the truth, uh, about six months ago, I finally said, man, no, not too many beers. I still going to have a couple, but really started uh, watching my diet. Mexican food, obviously, is my favorite. Oh, yeah. My son yeah. owns a Mexican restaurant. I'm eating Mexican food. because well, I like, You want to plug it right now? What's the next <laughs> yeah, what It's called Los Dos Molinos. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. His mom's side of the family has several. Oh, awesome. My son has his own uh, restaurant on Camelback and 10th Street. Nice. Right on, okay. right on, it's right New on. Mexican style, brother. It ain't Sonora style. For That's okay. Yeah, we grew up on it. Just yeah. that spicy hot difference. chili. Yeah. Cool, we'll right? plug it. I, got, I grew up going to Garcia's because right down the street. Yep. Yeah, right. So, Wes, <laughs> so Wes you, you, you brought up the money. You said money. Um, You don't have to say no figures. Does refereeing pay decent or good or what? Oh, honestly, we're the least paid of any professional uh, official in in professional sports. You know what? Okay. I, I I don't doubt that. And <laughs> and I won't say what we make. I mean, right? Yeah, yeah, right. You don't have to but, understand. But um, the difference with us is is that if we make a mistake, people go to the hospital and people can die. Right, mm -hmm. right. So you have, and then you're uninsured. You said. So we're also uninsured. They do have an insurance now that you can get to cover you, and it's cool. actually pretty reasonable. I don't know why. A lot of people don't have it, and and this is a good thing to let people know it is out there. You can, can get uh, insurance, and it costs like a couple hundred dollars a year. If you're going to be a mm -hmm. professional boxing referee, it's a good idea to get it because you never know what's going to happen. Absolutely. i got a really good friend of mine right now going through, and I've had several really good friends of mine's referees that people's died in the ring, and all of them have won their case, but it broke them. They be had to right. file bankruptcy because it cost them three, four hundred thousand dollars. People are suing them because, hey, my son died, or you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 it's hard to prove uh, that the referee was inefficient that caused the death. And most of them, they already had hematomas, things already going on in their brain. Uh, the they can't afford to give everybody a brain scan before, right. or you know, say you have swelling or there's some you are trauma in your brain. So there's, we have a pretty good way to not get because if we get if it's negligence, uh, you know it's it's uh, you know you can go to prison for that. Yeah. But the problem is the money it costs to defend yourself. Right. Hey Wes, real quick, real quick. Go ahead. A couple fights back, you took a punch to the throat. I tough did. beard. Yes, yeah. That's tough my beard. claim to fame. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's funny, yeah. Vegas finally <laughs> found me. <laughs> Vegas <laughs> finally <laughs> found me after 17 years. And it wasn't it wasn't Jack that hit you, right? <laughs> yeah. so, uh, you kind of <laughs> slipped it. You kind of slipped it. did slip it. I did slip it. I tell everybody I slipped the shot. The shot was coming. I watched it multiple times. You did slip it. I slipped it, man, because it was coming right at my jaw. And I slipped it. And it hit me in the microphone. Got me in the cheeks, bro. Yeah. And I remember I didn't think much about it, although my titty was hurt. So the next day, my little grandson comes up to me. His name's Max, Maximiliano. Right on. And he comes up and he goes, Grandpa. I seen you get hit last night. Oh. <laughs> I said, oh, I'm okay, mijito. <laughs> he, don't touch he goes, right let here. me see Coco. <laughs> and so I pulled off my shirt. Dude, I got a big old bruise. Oh, wow. oh. So you know what he did? He ran and got a band-aid and put it on there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it sounded worse because it hit the microphone. It hit the microphone. Yeah. That's right. what it did. Hit the mic and it, it drove it. It, it sounded worse. And I'll tell you, it hurt like shit, it dude. Hurts. But I just walked oh, away like it was yeah. another day. Yeah. Wow. Now, That's check it. this out. I When I did Oscar Valdez and Neverete. Uh, Tucson? Yeah. No. Yeah, yeah. No, no, right here. Right. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I refereed uh, Oscar like three world titles, but when he fought Neverette oh. here, Oscar hit me. 
I don't know if you remember the announcer said, West Mountain has been hit before and they almost got hit again. Well, guess what? <laughs> so me and Oscar, I, was, I just came back from the uh, from, uh, Dominican Republic uh, for a convention. And uh, Oscar was there. And, and uh, he comes over to me and shit. He goes, hey, man, thank you for that fight. He goes, you thinking about stopping that fight, huh? And I go, no. And he goes, yeah, everybody's talking shit to you because you didn't bring in the uh, the doctor. Mm -hmm. And I said, yeah, you know why? He goes, no, why? And I said, because I checked on you. I asked you if you could see. I could see your eye. We got two new doctors over there. They want to be, jump up there right away. Could uh -huh. you imagine if they came in and stopped that fight? Would have happened? You'd probably be all right. They would have killed me, Oscar. Yeah. I said, yeah. You know, because <laughs> when I stopped the fight uh, with Julio Cesar Chavez here, yes, Junior, sir. I was going to bring that. I got up. I got bombed on that with bottles. Me and Michael Buffer got bombed, <laughs> and I didn't even stop the fight. He quit. He quit. Uh, yeah. but, he quit. But, I was there. Yeah, I was there yeah. Too. so Oscar, I was Oscar there. said, no, man. He goes, man, I'm glad you're your referee because, you know, I still had a chance. And that's something you got to figure. First and foremost is health. His eye didn't completely sh shut until the, almost midway through the last round. Right. Mm -hmm. And it was almost shut then. Yeah. But there was no way in hell because he's still throwing with distinction. He's trying to get him <laughs> out of there. And I knew he could get him out of there if he hit him. So I didn't bring the... the I didn't bring the doctors in. I caught, I caught some flack on it right. until I was able to explain the reason why I didn't. He's a soldier. Yeah, with, yeah. with that, Wes, um, before we get into some rapid questions, uh, every, every referee has their little catchphrase. Can you tell uh, what's your catchphrase before the fight starts? Well, I had one for a long time, and I just recently changed it. Oh. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> I hope it's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah. Uh, well, at the end of what I'll say is, okay, fellas, went over the rules in the direction room. I want to check these trunks here. These are good. These are a little bit high. I'm going to let you work in here, there. I want you to have a clean fight, protect yourself at all times, touch them up, and bang at the bell. Yeah. 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 Hey, hey. Yeah. Huh? We're going to make a shirt. Yeah. Yes, I like the one where you said, let's get ready to bomb. Yeah, yeah I did. I, 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 so, I, 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 so you changed it up for the Paul fight. You know, yeah. that's why I said, said, let's get ready to bomb. And everybody. Yeah. Goes, yeah. Stop. Yeah. Stop. Yeah. Right yeah. So well, Michael's going to bounce some questions off you. These are, these are rapid fire questions, right? Shoot them away. All right. All right. So here we go. Rapid fire questions. What's your favorite cereal? Cereal? Cocoa Puffs. Cocoa Puffs? I go crazy for Cocoa Puffs. All right. If you were a pro fighter, what would be the song you would walk out to? Probably something from Metallica. Yeah! yeah. 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 Did you go to the concert, Wes? Huh? Did you go recently? No, I didn't. It uh, was awesome. Yeah, I was supposed was to go, dope. but I didn't end up going. All right, all right. And I listen to nothing but soul music, brother. There we go. Uh, you know, we but like something about Metallica. When you're coming you, out and you want to fight. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. If you ain't lit up after that, man. Something's yeah, wrong. you want to get in there and rumble, right? <laughs> Hit him, Michael. So hot wings, drumsticks or flats? Uh, drumsticks. Drumsticks. All right. We ask everybody that <laughs> yeah. question. Why? I don't know. <laughs> I, I, and it's about a 50-50 split. Got on more meat on them, brother. Yeah, you don't have to work as hard. You don't have to work as hard. Nope. Right. What's your favorite boxing movie? Rocky. Rocky. One, right two, three, or seven. <laughs> one. Yeah, yeah one. Rocky one. Yeah. Not Creed three. Yeah. <laughs> Chop it to the curb, bro. I wasn't in it. Right? Just remember, take her to the zoo, bro. <laughs> take her to the zoo. Uh, what was your your favorite, most memorable fight? And this doesn't, mean, be, this doesn't mean right when you raft one. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Most, your favorite fight of all fan. time. Well, the last one I did uh, with Neverette and, and Valdez. That was a dope yeah, that fight. Was a, that, that was a, a killer fight. Yeah, that, that was so, a good fight. Yeah, that, to, to date, it's probably the best. That's good. Okay. What about on a personal level when watching fights throughout back the, in the years? Days? Best fight I ever watched. Uh, Duran Hagler? Is what you said earlier? No, probably no. Duran Sugar Ray won. Oh. Okay. Oh. Everybody thought that Sugar Ray was going to whoop Duran's ass, and he wasn't having it. No. No. He wasn't having it. No, he, that wasn't. He that whooped was the his fight. ass. That little guy took it to him. That that was, he did. Fight. And that was my man, Durant. And when he beat Sugar Ray. You also mentioned uh, Hagler, uh, Hagler Hearns. Hagler Hearns was a good fight. You know, the three toughest rounds in, in boxing. Three, yeah, good. three rounds. Yeah. yeah, that was a damn good I don't know fight. if you guys remember, but Durant ended up taking Hagler the distance. But me and Rudy were talking about it earlier. 
Duran had his ass whooped. If it had been a twelve rounder, Duran would have won that fight. Yeah, yeah. He just yeah. Ran, he could ran out of gas. Yeah, yeah. He yeah. Ran out of gas, but he was whipping his ass. Yeah, I know yeah. we I know we ran out of time, but that was one of the things I wanted to talk to you because there was a few landmark fights that changed boxing. The boxing. When they went from fifteen to 15 twelve. Fifteen to twelve, you know. Fighters lost. Time. Fighters won. Yeah. Right. I mean, based yeah. on based, yeah. based on that change. Yeah. Fighters, Nelson. Remember that? Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the, the, what, the, guy, the guy from Mexico, San, Salvador Sanchez. Salvador Sanchez. Yeah. I refereed yeah. him in amateurs one time. Oh, Salvador? Wow. Yeah. Salvador Dude, he was one of the greatest, man. Too bad he died. He fought Little greatest. Red Lopez. Yeah, here. I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. And yeah. everybody yeah. started saying, yeah, Little Red's going to beat this dude. Yeah. But, oh, man, what a. No, man. Salvador took it to him. Who Salvador took it to him. Training? Yeah, we went to his training. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He was training over there at. Uh, I may even have seen you guys there. He was training. I think I remember seeing Jack or Rudy. Cause I got, we took a bunch of pictures. Uh, that, the club because, Sar? No, or? no. Uh, Little Red Lopez was training at the fairgrounds. At the fairgrounds. Yeah, I didn't oh. know anything about Salvador Sanchez. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, dude, he was. Dude. They just had a thing on him the other day that he won the greatest fires. That, oh, yeah, you know, dude, and oh. then, you know, unfortunately, he passed away. And Nello says he's the greatest Mexican. Oh, player. dude, I, I think, I, I think he, I t- definitely top two. I, he was phenomenal. He was phenomenal. I can't respond to that because I may have a chance to referee him, but. When you're talking about the greatest Mexican fighter that ever lived, there's a lot of them ahead of him that fought way more world champions. Yeah. And to me, that's the yardstick. Who have you fought? Right, right. Well, who's Nello your resume? Found, who's found, on your resume? Well, you got to get Julio Cesar Chavez Jr., Marcos Antonio Barrera. You know, I love him. Dude, he fought Eric, Eric uh, Morales, what, three times? And they were all, they, man, stuff. they were but damn good fights. But Barrera, he knocked out the prince. And the prince was Nassim talking. Nassim Hamed. Yeah. Nassim Hamed was talking a lot of shit. Yeah, yeah. Down. He bounced his head off the corner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey. Any more, more questions? Hey, well, I'm, 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 that's it. Okay. You're done? We're, that's it. We only had five. Yeah. No. Hey. Where's Jeff? Wes, thank you, man. This was this was absolutely phenomenal. It was I think I speak for all of us. It was our pleasure, man. Well, blessed to have you on the show, man. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Pleasure was mine getting to see uh, these guys, the Heisers. Heisers, the family to me. So uh, I didn't get likewise. to know you, uh, you guys, like yeah. I did them. Yeah, but no, that, like you talk about my from, dad. From, dad. From, from Joe on, uh, was in, it probably the, a lot of the reason inspired me into boxing. Yeah, she said Jack, right on, being around Jack. Uh, I've known really all of them, you know, so you have an incredible family. Thank, Thank you. And if at any time ever I can do anything uh, for you guys. Can't get you tickets or anything. Hey, but sometimes, hey, but sometimes, I was supposed to, but sometimes. Forget it, forget it. these guys well. Is this off the record? <laughs> sometimes I. Give me in the after party. Yeah, that's what I'm going to work on. Hey, but tell you what. So, all right, yeah. check, check this out. It's off the record. Go for it. Now, right? Go for it. No, no, it's all right. No, 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 hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. George, walk us home, baby. Oh, no. All right. Hey, Wes. We know. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's it's a great story, man. Fuck From the hood. Awesome. Butler. Isaac, Carl Hayden, now a referee at the championship level. Great to know you. Great to know that you know this family like that. Hey, great stories. Mm-hmm. We'd love to have you back if we can. Free tickets, maybe. No. Uh, no uh, <laughs> <laughs> Other than that, thank you very much. Hey, Timmy. My pleasure. Michael. Thank you. Chris, sitting in for Jeff. Duh, good. I'm thank George. You. We got the intern. This is Suniva Lifestyles presents... What's happening? Let's go! This is how we do it on the avenue.